there's a reason predicting earthquakes is so elusive. It's because the Earth just doesn't want to cooperate. But you're going to learn more in the next five minutes about why prediction is difficult than you have ever learned in your life. And that's because of Dr. Ross Stein. We'll begin with an earthquake that a lot of you watching now just might remember. In Santa Cruz, the Loma Prieta earthquake looked like this. The 1995 Kobe, Japan earthquake looked like this. And a quake in the laboratory might look like this. Well, this may not look like an earthquake, but this is the Earth's earthquake machine. The goal of any science model is to try to simulate what happens in the real world. But how can you simply simulate the motion of the Earth's plates, tension in the Earth's crust? And how can that show you that quakes are so unpredictable? The answer came to Dr. Ross Stein like a ton of bricks. What have you got here? I've got the earthquake machine that comes right out of the Earth. Ross is able to at least approximate the timing of quakes like this one that hit Northridge more than a decade ago. Using this simple model. Oh, that's good. He does it with sandpaper and bricks. I've stripped it down to the bare essentials. So that's all you need to see. And what are those essentials? First, there's the crank. And that represents the motion of the plate interior. In other words, all those 12 plates are moving around at a steady rate, moving at about the short width of a credit card a year. So we have a wire, which is a non-stretch wire, and that's connected to a bungee cord. And they're connected to the bricks, and that's the mass that's going to be moved in an earthquake. And they're sitting on Home Depot sandpaper, just plain old sandpaper, non-skid, that creates the friction in the system. So, plate motion, bungee cords, sandpaper, bricks. And that's all we need. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to start cranking at a steady rate. It's a slow, steady motion. And somehow, despite the fact that this motion is continuous, we get stick slip at the fault. We get long periods where nothing happens, punctuated by periods of earthquakes. Believe it or not, the key to why you can't predict this is about to be revealed by this simple experiment. One more time. Watch. The wire is pulling in, and so the stress is building up on our bungee cord. And eventually, the stress overcomes the frictional resistance at the fault. And when that happens, we're going to have an earthquake. And I got an earthquake. And we're going to have to wait a number of additional cranks until we have the next earthquake. Second earthquake. Third earthquake. Okay, so we had four earthquakes in this experiment, right? Was I cranking at a steady rate? Yeah. Okay, so I wasn't doing anything to force an earthquake or delay an earthquake. All right. Were all the earthquakes the same size? No. No, that second one was much bigger, right? Yes. Yeah. And the second one was followed by a longer period of time than the next one. So even though I cranked at a steady rate, I've got one piece of bungee cord here, I've got the same bricks, the same sandpaper, I'm not getting earthquakes of equal size out of this experiment. And I'm not getting equal weights between earthquakes, right? Right. That's very bad news. Because if I can't get regular periodic behavior out of this, we're never going to get it in the Earth. The Earth is going to be much more complicated than this. But if there's anything enormously complicated about the Earth, it's the weather. Day in and day out in the summertime, we know the fog is going to move in and burn off. 
We know the fog was going to burn off because we have satellite images and we know how the fog bank moves in from the Pacific and we know that the moisture is being sucked into the East Bay. We can measure the temperature difference between the Pacific and the Central Valley. So we know what drives the system. And our problem for earthquakes is we can't make the measurements, the equivalent measurements of the Pacific and the Central Valley, because they're all 10 miles down. So you're saying you're never going to be able to predict earthquakes? Well, I'm not going quite that far. I'm saying that at least the Earth is going to be more cunning. It's going to give away its secrets more, more hesitantly than that. In other words, maybe I can use something about the variability of the size of the earthquakes and the wait times to say something about the next one. What I'm not going to be able to do is to say, okay, this fault produces magnitude 7, let's say the Hayward Fault. This fault has earthquakes separated by about 140 years, and then we just wait. When we get to 139 years after the next earthquake, I say, okay, I sound the alarm. That's what I won't be able to do because there's too much variability and there's too much variability even when I simplify this thing to the bare essential. So does that mean scientists here in Menlo Park just give up? Of course not. Even if they're lacking the big clue, they do have a gut, an instinct, mixed with their scientific knowledge about the fault in the Bay Area that is the likely trigger for the next big quake. And we'll tell you which fault that is after a break.